Welcome everybody. It's lovely to see everyone joining us. And it would be fantastic if you could let us know where you're joining from while we wait for everyone to arrive. Um, we know that there have been some Zoom updates and various things that might mean people take a moment uh, to check in. So I'm Anita Taylor and I'm here on, on the Drawing Projects uh, screen. Um, so it's just really great to be able to see you all joining. So welcome to Jane from Aaron. Let's see where everybody else is joining from. We might have a very good Scottish contingent. We've got people from Froome in Somerset, someone from South Wales, Hampshire, Bristol, Cheltenham, Fife, London, Forest of Dean, York, Oxfordshire, more Fife. We're very happy about that up in Dundee. Uh, Trowbridge, brilliant. Loughborough, Arbroath, Manchester. It's really great to see where everyone's from. From Berlin, Switzerland. Hello, Marcel and Regula. Hello from London, from Elisa Alalusia. Hello to Anna from Edinburgh College of Art, from Larg. Uh, there's some more people waiting to join. So we've got quite a full booking this evening, but we don't yet have everybody here. So we will just gather um, and pa be patient as we wait for people to join. So please do, you've got a moment um, to get hold of a cup of tea, glass of wine, whatever it might be, wherever you are in the world. Lovely to see people joining from Cookham. Great to see Declan from MFA Drawing in Dundee. Um, great to see people from Kent, from Lancaster, the New Forest. So we're well distributed in the UK this evening. I'm in Princeton, New Jersey. Brilliant. Great to see have someone here from Princeton. That's wonderful. <laughs> so we are just patiently waiting. We will start when we're just about five past um, and people will still be joining. Uh, we have a co-host this evening, Fiona Cassidy, who's going to be able to manage people popping in um when they arrive but i think you probably will see that up on the screen which is why uh, we're trying to get everybody in first and that's a really good question from tanya so now you can tell us all what the temperature is where you are given that we're talking about ice and water is anyone going to give us that chili <laughs> chili in wiltshire <laughs> it's chilly in Dundee. We've still got people just gathering. Warmish in Bristol. There you go. Is it warmish in Bristol, Emma? It's unseasonably warm, yes. <laughs> Ridiculous. 18 in kitchen, rainy and a bit blowy wherever Sandy is. Six degrees and huge rains in five. Well, I agree with that. I look as though I've been slightly wet today. And some people are very cosy in their front room. I think that's a really good idea. Brilliant. So I think that we're, I'm going just looking at my co convener, co-host, co-pilot to check that we're ready to go. Yeah, we're ready to go. Can I say the warmest welcome this evening to everyone joining us? I'm Anita Taylor and I'm here on behalf of Drawing Projects UK and I'm also the Dean at Duncan of Jordanston College of Art and Design. So we're, I'm broadcasting from Dundee this evening. Um, it's a real joy to welcome everyone. This is the first of three discussions around um, and provoked and inspired by Sarah Casey's exhibition Emergency, which is being held at Drawing Projects UK at present. It opened last week as part of the Beyond Being Human Festival of the Humanities uh, in association with Lancaster University. So it's a wonderful collaboration uh, as an event, but it's also the most 
wonderful exhibition. So for those of you that can join us in Drawing Project UK in Wiltshire, please do make the expedition to see a really wonderful exhibition, um, which is made in response to glacial archaeology. But you're going to hear about that from Sarah herself um, as we start the session. But we're joined this evening by Sarah, who's a visual artist and researcher working at the cusp of drawing and sculpture. And Sarah has, has held many solo exhibitions, but she's also the co-author of Drawing Investigations and Senior Lecturer of Drawing and Installation at Lancaster University, where she's Director of the School of Fine Art. We're also joined uh, by Emma Stibben this evening, who's a wonderful artist um, and is an academic as well, but is really renowned for her work um, sorry, I've got a glitch on my notes here, so I apologise. Um, who works primarily in drawing and print on paper, depicting environments that are undergoing transformation. So Emma's taken part in several international residencies, uh, including those in Antarctica, which again, I believe we're going to hear about this evening. Um, and we're really, really thrilled to have Emma with us this evening. Tanya Kovats is Professor of Drawing and Making at the University of Dundee and a distinguished artist who makes drawing, sculpture and installations and large scale time-based projects that explore our experience and understanding of the natural world. Tanya is well known for her writing on drawing and she's also um, obviously our, one of our distinguished professors here at the University of Dundee. I'm really looking forward to the conversation and to hearing more about drawing from ice and water and drawing in precarious environments. It's wonderful to have this artist-led panel uh, to present to us this evening, and I'm really looking forward to a discussion. Please make sure that you pop questions into the chat function. You will be able, we will convene that and share that at the end of this session. So we're going to invite Sarah and Emma and Tanya to present on their work. Uh, first, and then we'll open up to questions for everyone to join in. Um, I think it's the moment with the slight kick up as I'm dragging the slides, so hopefully that won't go too wrong. Um, I'm sure it won't because we're really looking forward to a really brilliant session. First of all, we're going to welcome Sarah Casey uh, to talk to us to introduce the session through her research and practice. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Anita. Hi. So um, it's a real pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for hosting this. And um, it's fantastic to be able to join um, both Tanya and Emma in this discussion. So my way into this topic about precarious landscapes of ice and water has been through this route of glacial archaeology. And I should say that my work prior to this project had been very much focused on collections and objects and thinking about the visibility, um, themes of visibility and preservation. What does it mean to last? Um, what gets kept for the future? Why and for who? And these questions have shaped my approach to thinking about ice and landscapes. So I'll say about the bit about this context of glacial archaeology and my interest in it, how I've responded to it, reflecting on the kind of provocation it offers to drawing and conversely also how drawing might be a useful tool to help us to think through the challenges that glacial archaeology presents. Next slide please. So having said that I'm going to start with ice. So we think we know ice, that kind of cold, hard, translucent stuff. It's frozen water, right? Um, but glaciers, however, are not just ice. Um, while they do contain water, they contain a lot of debris too, and kind of rocks and rubble. And as they move, a glacier, as you probably know, scours the landscape. It kind of picks up what's in its path. And you may be familiar with the idea of erratics, these boulders that are picked up by glacial action and move many hundreds of miles. Um, next slide, please. But at times, the glaciers also contain traces of human pasts. And it's this that I find really fascinating. All too often glaciers are characterized as something remote over there, devoid of human entity, a kind of something far from human presence. But the fact is that high alpine environments 
um, glaciers were not always feared and avoided. They provided often passageways between villages and communities on either side of, of a valley. Um, and settlements that today may seem remote from each other were not always so. So a passage over ice could be much easier to traverse than the sheer faces of rock that we see remaining today. So what really re interests me is this relationship, um, if you like, this entanglement between the human and the geological as embodied in glaciers. And this is made especially poignant in the and apparent when we're confronted with glacial archaeology. Next slide, please. So what is glacial archaeology? So you'll get a much fuller and richer description of this and a much more authoritative one too in the next series, the next talk in this series of events at Drawing Projects on 1st of December when we've got two glacial archaeologists um, joining me in conversation. But in brief, I'll give a short description. So glacial archaeology is man-made traces of the human past that are frozen in time in the landscape. And by that, I mean in ice patches and um, um, in glaciers, but the increased effects of global heating artifacts are emerging as the ice sheets in which they've been preserved for maybe 50, 500, 5,000 years are simply melting away as the ice thaws, these objects are emerging. But more worrying still, these artifacts are particularly vulnerable um, because while these kind of really arid sub-zero temperatures of the glacier has preserved material that wouldn't otherwise remain, things like hair, leather, textiles. Um, but once exposed to the air, these fragile structures are really quickly deteriorate once they've been exposed and will also be lost. Next slide, please. And more compelling still is that unlike terrestrial archeology span in the ground, the finds don't always follow the same kind of layered stratigraphy um, that we might find in, in the earth with the perhaps the newest on tops. And they're without context. You can't date them from the soil in which they're buried. Um, and I was piqued by this idea of a glacier of a kind of unruly archive, a kind of collection storing things, but then these things emerging from different time frames um, on the surface as the ice is now melting at unprecedented rates. And we're going to talk about how I've approached it in this topic. And the project's called Emergency. Next, next slide, please. And this came, quote came from Rebecca Solnit's Hope in the Dark. Um, and having worked previously with museum collections as a kind of stimulus for thinking about loss and changing futures, I was really struck by this embodiment in these glacial archaeological objects, um, this embodiment of the precarity of our environment, the challenges they pose, and how to think about the emergence of something out of loss. And as Rebecca Sonnet says, inside the word emergency is emerge. It means from an emergency, new things come forth, which I think really poetically resonates with these artifacts. So next slide, please. So glacial archeology. span Well, my interest in the topic really began in 2018 when I learned of an exhibition of artifacts on display at the Valley History Museum in Sion, in Switzerland, that's in the Valley, um, region of Switzerland. So I traveled to see them and I ended up being able to strike up a dialogue with the curator there, Pierre-Yves Nicot, um, and who very generously um, responded to me, taught me around the show, answered loads of questions about the artifacts, and then kind of kept up a dialogue with me afterwards. So while I was there with these artifacts, I spent time with them, drawing them as a way into understanding understanding them, what is this that I'm seeing? How can I understand them? How might drawing work as a kind of proxy for touching? Um, how might it enable me to get close to them? Um, and then last year, I, I was fortunate to be able to get a Fairnby Moore Fellowship to pursue this work for the, further, to think about this absent and presence. And the question I was thinking there was, how can I use this kind of material and visual language of drawing to capture that sense of the artifacts? Um, which gives this kind of really fascinating and valuable insight into human history, but come at the cost of lost ice and all the, pre the, the kind of problems that that's presenting us now with in the world. So this was particularly interesting in thinking of drawing, which is a tool of marking, a means of preserving an action or a gesture. It leaves a, a sense of its material record of a presence in time. Um, you leave a mark, you leave a trace, it's kind of fixed and held. 
And so what I ended up doing was making a series of works with graphite dust in wax paper. So what you're seeing on the screen now are a series of like three or four drawings layered up. And each drawing is, if you like, sandwiched flat. Like on one layer, you've got graphite dust, and then another layer on top, and then that's fused shut with an iron, and that traps, traps the drawing. And so they're on these kind of sheets of wax, translucent wax paper, and the drawing is just trapped in, in the dust inside. And so you've got this kind of frozen moment of this particular artifact. And I began to, if you like, layer these up in space, one on top of another, thinking about that way that the artifacts emerge, this kind of unruly archive of objects appearing from different timescales and then hanging them in space. So they're not kind of fixed, they're not like rooted to the ground, but neither are they up in the air. They're somehow in this kind of limbo um, in a space as well. And one of the things about making them in wax, of course, if they get too hot, they're gonna simply kind of fade or melt away. So like the objects they depict, they're really vulnerable to the conditions of their environment around them. Next slide, please. And you can see these have been, these hanging drawings have been combined with other ones on the floor in which I, crum actually some of these wax drawings, I began to kind of crumple these up and fold them to make this kind of um, topography. Um, next slide, please. So that's just a detail close up. So what you're looking at there is a drawing of a 16th century dagger that was found in the Theodore Glacier. And you can get a sense of how the kind of wax um, the graphite just disperses into the wax, but by kind of making this kind of this kind of folded terrain or topography over the gallery floor um, with these objects, sort of just hints of them um, poking out. It also kind of references the something that's discarded, overlooked, or thrown away. Um, which, as I mentioned, these these objects are very vulnerable. They're often overlooked, and in fact, can often be very hard to um, find or detect. Um, because of where they're found. Next slide, please. So these ideas have all been brought together in the exhibition that's on display at Drawing Project. Um, as you see, they're hung up in space. The light filters through, creating a kind of, the shadows of the sheets behind coming to the fore. And as you enter the room, the drawings will shift and shimmy and sway, and things at the back and the front will move in relation to each other becoming apparent and disappearing, appearing and disappearing with each other. And as a viewer, you have to negotiate um, the space. You have to be able to move around that, um, um, to be able to see the work. And you, be, because of the size and the scale of the works, for instance, the, the drawing on the left-hand side here is four meters long. There's a kind of embodied confrontation with the work. So there's this physical, I don't know, a perception, this physical encounter with these things placed in a situation where our body perceives this vulnerability of this non-framed, very fine, very thin sheet of paper and as a way of trying to sense or feel um, some of that precarity that these objects um, represent. So, so what's next? Just briefly moving on. Um, next slide, please. There's a few more slides of the exhibition. Next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the drawings are contingent and that they might melt if they're exposed to heat. And this summer I had a chance to test this, um, taking the drawings back to Switzerland near to some of the glacial sites in which some of the artifacts were found. And so this is me testing a kind of drawing scored into wax, really melting away. Um, and I'm gonna be developing this process um, further next summer with a residency with um, the Museum of Art and the Museum of History at Valley, uh, Valley Museums. So just the final slide now, please. Um, and why I think this is quite interesting and important, because I mentioned drawing as a record of trace or time, it's can drawing be also be not just a record of trace of presence, but also a record of di disintegration and of erasure. So just as we draw a line and leave a trace, so too might its unmaking um, be revealed in the melting and consequently might the the kind of level of this melt the extent to which something is undrawn um, through melting record the action of the sun um, and so while this kind of inscribed mark like the ice is going to disappear this kind of 
action of the trace of it disappearing will remain visible, recording its passage um, as a form of anti-drawing. So thank you very much. I'll end there and I'll hand over to Emma. Sorry, I ran over slightly. I was... Not at all, you're fine. Thank you, Sarah, for a fantastic um, starting presentation. So over to Emma, thank you. Thank you, um, Anita, and gosh, Sarah, Sarah, that's fantastic to hear. Um, I saw Sarah's beautiful exhibition at the Drawing Centre, and I definitely uh, encourage anyone who can get to Trowbridge to visit it. It's it's an, a sort of sens sensory experience. Um, um, I'm going to put my pen up. Yes, for you will. Um, Thank you. Um, I've long, long been attracted to precarious environments um, and undergoing change. Um, definitely, obviously, I'm aware that we're living through precarious, unprecedented times. Um, and as an artist, I feel a commitment, I guess, to representing that in my, the sort of changes in my work. Um, my preoccupation with icy places, next slide. Um, stems from, I guess, you know, the incredible beauty and wonder of extreme locations um, that are set against that awareness that the retreat of polar ice sheets and glaciers are having. Um, and of course, you know, that's having a profound effect on our global environment through sea, sea level rise and extreme weather events. Um, and for a number of years now, um, I guess I've been looking at that retreat across um, glaciers and ice sheets um, you know, across the planet. Um, this here is the ship HMS Protector, which is an icebreaker, uh, which I traveled with um, the Royal Navy in the Antarctic, I think in 2004, um, um, along the Antarctic uh, Peninsula, um, which was extraordinary um, to witness. Uh, sorry, next slide, please. Um, and for me, it always starts with drawing out there in the field. Um, I'm interested, I guess, in how I can communicate about that experience, that sort of physical, visceral sense of being in a place. Um, I do a lot of walking um, in the elements, drawing from observation, using my camera, um, maybe gathering some earth materials or actual kind of um, elements whilst I'm out that I might incorporate back in the studio. Um, next slide. Um, so whilst I was in Antarctica, uh, I made many sketchbook drawings, um, observations to try and record and capture something of that monumentality of what I was seeing, but also the kind of fragility of it. Um, and here we can see some ice sheets, um, that some ice fonts that I witnessed along the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, I kind of fill the sketchbooks, um, but also, next slide, please. Um, you know, it's it's a combination of that and uh, my digital camera. These drawings here were made um, on a crossing that I made um, from the Barents Sea, uh, from the north of Norway and up to the Svalbard in the high Arctic. So. Um, it was a, a small sail, wooden sailing vessel um, and over the three day passage, I think I made about 50 small drawings out on deck. Um, and literally as we kind of traveled further and further north, the sea was really, really big and rough. Um, you could actually see the, the wet media freezing on the page. So it was kind of interesting to review that in the um, drawings um, here. I think probably you could just about see in the bottom left one, the ice crystals that have kind of formed within the media. Oh, next slide, please. So um, drawing, I guess, from observation, you know, has that different sense to being in the studio. Um, there's that kind of urgency of the weather and challenges of, of the elements and wind, maybe eaten by a bear in Svalbard. Um, and that physical experience, I think, is really, um, part of the drawing process. And I, I, when I review my drawings that I make out in on site, um, I have incredible recall of that experience, which um, is quite different to when I look back and review my photographs, which don't seem to have that imprint on them. Um, so I guess there's something in the process of making the drawing that um, somehow 
um, sits in my memory. Uh, next slide, please. So back in the studio, you know, I have this enormous mass of um, sketchbook drawings, thousands of photographs, um, which will come together back in the studio to plan out my larger studio works. Um, that might mean taking it through, um, I use the photocopier a lot. I really like the kind of graininess to, to um, crop images, um, collage, redrawing over sort of composites. Um, and I guess the, the kind of what I'm, my thought process is around um, the composition and the sort of structuring of the image. Um, I really want to kind of bring the viewer into that picture space um, in the structuring of the image. Uh, next slide, please. So um, a large work like this watercolour with graphite powder um, of a glacier tongue. Um, I guess the media and the surfaces that I draw on, like Sarah was discussing, you know, that the kind of surface of paper is really important. Um, and something about that fragility of the landscape and the actual media that I'm drawing with, that sort of haptic surface of the drawing space, um, it's sort of bringing that together. Um, and also scale. I mean, this is a kind of nearly two metre wide drawing. Um, and I think with glasses in particular, there's something um, which Sarah touched on about that kind of moving entity of ice. Um, it's a place also, um, not just the physicality of that, but the, the kind of deep psychological imagining that, that you kind of experience when you're confronting a glacier. Um, uh, the next slide. Uh, so a smaller drawing here, which is a tidewater glacier. Uh, this one is uh, made with white chalk on a blackboard surface. Um, and yeah, I guess, again, using a chalk to draw, in, draw with, obviously this could just be erased if you sort of rubbed your hand over the surface of the board. Um, I kind of wanted to both render the image um, using a media that's friable, but also as a kind of metaphorical standing in for the subject itself. Uh, next slide. Um, this drawing is another large uh, Indian ink and carbon powder um, on paper drawing. Um, I think when I'm making a drawing, yeah, definitely it's about that sort of physical, visceral sense of being somewhere um, and the sort of scaling of that and in the gallery space, um, I kind of want to present the viewer with a sense of encounter or immersion that there's a kind of entering into the image. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, this is an ice sheet again from the peninsula of Antarctica. Um, I mean, I, I'm obviously incredibly fortunate that I've I had that kind of privilege of witnessing many of these amazing locations. Um, I mean, Antarctica was, it, it is like a kind of mirage almost. It's like passing through this strange ethereal light. Um, and and I, I think that's sort of the motivation, you know, it's the, the kind of wonder and extreme kind of experience of that. But um, I think my commitment to, to the scale of the drawing and the sort of time that takes is also about, you know, a homage to, to the kind of glacier or the ice sheet that, that is there. It's a transitory thing. It's rapidly changing, you know, in our lifetimes. Um, another slide, please. Um, and obviously our wonder, you know, and all before nature does, you know, I'm, I'm referencing quite often that tradition of the sublime, which, you know, Edmund Burke identified in the 18th century as the psychological state we experience when we're confronted with the immense or the awful places. Um, and usually the viewer in that sense is positioned from a, um, a kind of uh, safe place viewing this, um, this kind of awe or, or awful place. Um, I think with my work in the kind of present 20th century view, um, I'm really aware of that sense we're no longer in this kind of position of safety, you know, um, it's trying to sort of slightly unsettle the viewpoint through the composition and structuring of the image. So um, I'm kind of trying to give that sense to the viewer by a, a kind of tipping of, of the image. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, and yeah, quite often I'm developing a project, um, looking, you know, through dialogue with with other scientists. Or um, this is actually a good friend of mine now, Professor Kathy Cashman, who's an earth scientist um, and was at the time at the University of Bristol. Um, but that that dialogue into the sort of you know her profound knowledge of um, you know the forces that drive change in landscape. Um, which really is um, kind of important in terms of uh, recognizing features and understanding what I'm looking at when I'm out in the field. If I could have the next slide. Um, <clears throat> so clearly glaciers um, have been retreating since the kind of 1850s at the end of the little ice age, you can see in the graph there on the right. Um, and that correlates with the increasing CO2 levels, which we can see in the graph on the left. Um, and yeah, I, I think that kind of obvious correlation and, and the actual visual witness of that is something that I find very motivating in terms of um, the work that I make. Thanks. The next slide. Um, a project that I had uh, a while back in 2018 was um, a commission from York Art Gallery in Abbott Hall, Cumbria. Um, they had a big exhibition, um, Ruskin, Turner and the Storm Cloud. Um, and I decided uh, to make a present day kind of ground witness view of the glaciated landscape that Ruskin had visited in 1854. Um, so I visited Chamonix on the 25th of June, 2018, which was as close as possible to the sort of seasonal date and viewpoint that Ruskin and his assistant, Frederick Crawley had made to, to take the image on the left, which is um, an absolutely exquisite daguerreotype photograph. Um, and at the Mer de Glass, when I visited, you know, comparing it to Ruskin's, it was virtually unrecognizable. Um, and you can see, you know, literally the sea of ice in his image there, flowing past the observation hut at Montan there. Um, and today at this time of year in my cyanotype image on the right, um, the exposed valley floor, you know, presents this really dark moraine, um, empty, of almost completely devoid of ice. Um, and I think, yeah, the, it, the retreat from the Mare de Glace has been about two kilometres from its 1850 position. So I obviously expected to see a comparative change, you know, to, to the Ruskin photograph. But I think what really shocked me was um, having visited the site uh, 10 years previously, it had majorly gone back since my last visit. So, you know, it really brought home to me um, that, you know, it's happening in my lifetime, that kind of sense of witness and actually documenting something uh, that's literally before, before my eyes. Um, the next slide, please. Um, so although, you know, not directly icy, um, I thought I'd include something um, a bit different to my ice works. Um, it's obviously connected to climate warming and it's a more local event, um, which was a forest fire in Wareham in Dorset, uh, which made me, led me to think about the increasing devastating forest fires across the globe. Um, and I approached the Forestry England who gave me permission to salvage the burnt timber from the Wareham forest to incorporate into my drawing. Um, and it's, yeah, a big wall drawing about five meters wide um, from charcoal and carbonized wood that I found on the forest floor. Um, and I incorporated the carbonized conifer trees in front of it, sort of setting it into the, to the floor space. Um, to, to kind of, I think my aim was really to try and create this really immersive experience for the viewer. Um, hopefully, you know, acting as a stark reminder that with climate change, you know, um, climate warming, these devastating forest fires are now increasing globally really rapidly. Um, I'll have the last slide, thank you. Um, another ice front in Antarctica. Um, so really, yeah, I, I feel strongly that the capacity of drawing to connect us is really palpable. Um, and for me as an artist, you know, that sense of witness to what's happening in our lifetime. Um, and the challenge I think for me is to try and render this uncertain future to to, to audiences through drawing um, because 
I, I feel, you know, that whilst scientific data clearly demonstrates the impact of dramatic increases in global warming, um, and we can see the, the effects of this for ourselves, um, there's this growing gap between our understanding and our willingness to take action. Um, and I, I believe and hope that, you know, creative methods of communication kind of engage us on an emotional level um, and that can contribute to galvanizing us to perhaps change our behavior. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emma, that was a fantastic presentation, such stunning images uh, and work, so thank you. Um, I'm really thrilled to welcome Tanya. Um, so welcome Tanya and over to you, the spotlight will change um, in a moment. I also have a pen that I'm going to make. Brilliant. Um, uh, I suppose when preparing for this, I, I'm, I'm not such a kind of, I'm more watery than ice. I'm, I'm, I deal with water in its liquid state, but um, I suppose I wanted to kind of reflect on my own journey in, in my practice and life where they cross over um, of my kind of environmental uh, evolution within my practice. Um, and I, I've made work about landscape for many years and hadn't fully appreciated how, as a sculptor, um, it was uh, often water in the landscape that had already sculpted the landscapes I was looking at, whether these were coastal eroded sites or quarries or gorges that have been carved by rivers. So I I've kind of wanted to show this slide first. Um, this is a drawing that's really important to me. It's, uh, uh, well, many people, it's one of the most important kind of drawings in the world of kind of visual science. Um, it's a page from Darwin's notebook book where he first kind of visualizes the theory of evolution um, and I suppose one of my ways into understanding the landscape understanding um, who we are and how we got here was the whole period of kind of research into Darwin's thinking as I made this work to celebrate his bicentenary which is called Tree and that's in the Natural History Museum and it came out of a period of traveling in South America um, I remember making the proposal in the back of a camper van in Patagonia after having seen things like the Patagonian ice fields this great kind of blank on a map which is when you approach it also a blank in the landscape um, yeah just remarkable kind of encounters with with ice that I had never experienced before and thinking about Darwin's ideas of how things are all entangled and connected and how one thing has come from another next slide please uh, whilst traveling unlike Emma I don't I can't make drawings of the landscapes I'm in but I often draw the guides to them so this is my road atlas to South America and I drew my sorry next slide uh, Charles Darwin's voyage of the beagle which is still a remarkably uh, good interpretation of the geology of South America um, I was able to go to the high Arctic as part of an expedition for a project called Nowhere Island, which was um, actually my partner, Alex Hartley, who's also an art artist's uh, project for the Cultural Olympiad, where he brought back an island that had been re um, revealed from a retreating glacier in Svalbard. But for me, this was the first time seeing these great walls of ice, hearing these great walls of ice. Glaciers are quite noisy and seeing how dynamic and forceful they are and um, I've always understood landscape to be in a state of flux but you see that flux um, accelerated um, when you're in the presence of these landforms um, and uh, I then kind of refocused my work after that encounter to um, uh, to uh, focus more on water as an element itself. And this was my first drawing water where I drew water from a, a hundred rivers around the UK and housed them in a boathouse. Um, bringing waters that aren't normally um, close to each other into a state of confluence and making moving water still. Um, I then went on to make a, a larger kind of connecting 
uh, water piece called All the Seas, where I asked people to send me water from around the world, uh, which they did. I made this um, initially for the Fruit Market Gallery in Edinburgh. Um, and it was, again, about uh, it wasn't about collecting data, it wasn't about serving the water, salinity levels or pollution levels or levels of plastic. It was about um, the idea of bringing all, all the seas to one place to kind of talk about connectivity, to talk about how actually, though we name on seas and, and give them kind of zones, there is, there is only one sea that with this vast kind of interconnected hydro system on the planet. Um, whilst um, making this work, I was also collecting how water appears in our visual record for this publication, Drawing Water. Um, not, not long after that, um, I was given an opportunity to investigate James Lovelock's thinking about, um, well, I chose to look at his, his theories, um, Gaia theory in relation to the world's oceans. Um, again, thinking about connectivity, we, we divide our whole bodies of water, but I chose to kind of show the world's three largest oceans, ta taking them from maps, taking them from globes, and then uh, making these ocean bulbs, uh, bowls in, the, in these sort of various states of entropy. They were made out of steel, and I rusted that steel with salt water into their surface, surfaces. Um, so uh, after after kind of encountering Darwin, after encountering Lovelock, as an artist working um, in landscape, this my concerns became increasingly focused on environmental issues. I had a short fellowship at the Global System, Systems Institute, Exeter University, where I went looking for the equivalent of Darwin's tree sketch to talk about the climate crisis that we are currently in. And this, uh, after kind of um, harvesting a number of drawings from various uh, climate scientists and people engaged in the study of global systems. Um, this drawing by Professor Tim Lenton, to me, I think sums up um, the feedback loop that we're in on the planet that is impacting so devastatingly on, on our planet's future and present. Um, so I, I don't know if it will become as iconic as Darwin's tree, but certainly at the moment, I think it, it's doing a very good job. Um, another encounter that I think has been really profound for me has been um, Rachel Carson's book, The Sea Around Us. Um, this incredible marine biologist wrote the story of our sea um, as a poet as well as a scientist. And I've drawn this book repeatedly, um, many different copies uh, or editions of it over time. I've started drawing it in different languages now as well so that I'm tracking them down slowly um, um, and the next kind of stage I think of my environmental learning and thinking has um, been facilitated by a trip to New Zealand and encounters with indigenous Maori people um, for uh, it was an invitation from a drawing ecology group um, to go and look at uh, river problems in New Zealand through creative activity and through drawing. Whilst there, I met with activists from the Fanganui River who had been successful after many years of campaigning of getting this river inscribed with the same human rights as any ancestor or member of the family. So this river is now a living entity um, and has its um, entity inscribed in law, both in its physical body and its metaphysical body, which again is kind of quite quite a mind blowing um, legal conversation to um, it sort of go down that um, line of thought, but really a really radical step in how we move forward, thinking about the planet we occupy and um, the things in it that, that, that they don't, um, yeah, how, how you then kind of address landscape features once they have that kind of um, respect inscribed in law. So next slide. Um, going to show you some slightly more recent work. Uh, this is a series of work um, I've, I've, that I've, where I've addressed flooding 
Um, so again, water is there, but uh, um, you know, flooding is a major kind of environmental challenge locally, nationally, globally. Um, and it's a devastating event when it's just one kind of storm and one local thing, or um, obviously it can paralyze whole areas, paralyze whole um, kind of nations at times. And it's only going to kind of be more uh, impactful on how we live our lives. Um, and I've made a series of these books and they're called books from the flooded library. So I'm casting books and dipping them in ink as if everything we've learned, everything we've written down is um, under threat and could be washed away or just kind of turned to a stain. Um, this is a drawing I make repeatedly, it's called C Mark, and it's about drawing to the horizon. And it's about drawing um, the sort of space, quite a meditative space um, of the sea. And I've taken this drawing into a series of um, drinking water fountains, so working in ceramics, um, that are sited in public places um, with the idea of reducing the use of single use plastic bottles so you can refill your uh, drinking water bottle at the fountain. Um, they're called Well. Uh, this one's situated in the Government Art Collection in the reception in which is in old, the old Am Admiralty building um, in Whitehall which is, is covered in sea motifs and things like this so it's, it's um, very nice to have made this work for that space. Um, I've made a series of books, a uh, series of um, drawings onto Atlas called Sea Stains, where I kind of try and indicate how the activities on land um, are affecting our seas through this sort of staining of the maps. Um, and I've been making for some time now, so, uh, a series of works onto hydrological charts, so sea charts. Obviously, as land based creatures, we have a tendency to be uh, sea blind. You know, we're not we're not as focused on on the importance and fragility of our oceans. But I, I suppose that's something within my practice that I hope to address to um, increase our um, appreciation of the importance of our waters. Um, this is a recent work just gone and show at Pallant House in Chichester. It's another river collection work, um, collecting water from 78 different streams and rivers in Sussex for a show that's called Sussex Landscapes. Um, at I was born in Brighton, so I was invited to come back and explore my backwaters somehow with this work. Um, and a more recent, oh, sorry, uh, a piece I finished this summer is called Co-Tidal. Uh, so quite new kind of uh, exploration of working with film, working with my drawings in film. Um, the Book of Seas features quite heavily in co-tidal um, and it was a commission from the uh, Time and Tide Bell organisation who are um, placing various bells in locations around the UK to draw attention to um, how precarious our situation is, how, pre how people living in uh, coastal situations are at the front line of our climate crisis and rising sea levels um, as a consequence of a uh, glacier melt, of a consequence of ice, ice bo bodies of ice melting and uh, temperature rising um, will start to impact on all of us and uh, there are many places around the world where this is already being felt and there is there's a real difficulty in knowing what we know about um, our climate crisis and, and it's so hard to fully appreciate what we're being told what 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 uh, what we don't want to know actually um, you know for very obvious reasons um, and I think art has a really uh, important role to play in negotiating our knowledge, negotiating this data and understanding in both our conscious and unconscious mind and, and making a kind of activism um, that isn't, um, you know, I, I, I'm not, um, I'm not an activist with a capital A, but I, I kind of feel like as an artist, I have a responsibility to address these issues 
in whatever way I can and help other people um, kind of acknowledge some of the challenges that we're up against. So Co-Tidal was made by inviting people to send me um, clips that they have taken and ask, answering the question, what do they see when they see the sea? And um, yeah, thank you very much. I collect seas, all the seas. I asked you, what do you see when you see the sea? This is what you shared with me. These are your seen seas. Oh. and I can't get out of it um let's just see if we can there we go can I say a huge thank you Tanya that was a wonderful presentation and we're now I mean there were three fantastic presentations that raised so many questions but also the real wonder that artists can bring in terms of perspicacity of understanding and documenting and witnessing um, transition and change. Um, we're now at the point in the presentation of, of the evening where Fiona will probably just spotlight all speakers and I'm going to take the slide down so that we can actually see everybody on screen um, and go from there. But please pop questions in the chat and um, we will, once I've got rid of this slide, be able to see everybody, which is actually really rather wonderful. Um, so fantastic, really great to see everybody. And I'm sure that there are lots and lots of questions coming in into the chat. And I'm sure um, that we need to, um, I'm sure there are questions from the panel to the panel. And I don't know if Sarah or Emma want to um, add anything or ask a question of each other, because I think the connectivity and it may be Sarah that you've got something you would like to to introduce our discussion with given that you've in a way like curated our panel with a very particular reason and rationale and I think you know the the sense of working in precarious environments is absolutely clear and the precarity of our world um, is absolutely um, fundamental across all three of these presentations. So Sarah, I don't know if you want to have the first comment or question, and then I'll go to the chat to pick up everything in there. Okay, well, just thank you to Emma and Tanya, because that was absolutely fantastic. And what I found really interesting, and one of the things I was interested to, if we were put together to speak is this around this theme of kind of change or precarity. And one thing that came out, I thought quite strong was this idea of a flux of things being in motion Tanya, you know, these these environments you think of the rock as being something really solid but actually it's been shaped and changed um by the by the water and emma talking about kind of how the materials were she was watching them shape and form and change on the page as as the water froze um and so on and so there's this strong sense of kind of the some that which is fixed the material presence of the rock and the fluidity of water, but them um, having this relationship of coming together. And I just wondered, and this might be a, a bit of an odd question, whether either of you had anything to say about that drawing being both this act of marking and fixing, but also it's kind of openness and capacity to talk about change. So you, you you talk about change of flux and, and these precarious or moving or shifting environments very much. Um, and I just wondered if there was something that about drawing that lent itself peculiarly to this. Perhaps I could just, um, if that's all right, Tanya, come, come in on the, the experience I had of making those uh, little drawings of the sea on deck as I was crossing this barren sea, which was 
started out, I mean, it was really rough and, and wild, but um, it started off at probably about seven degrees air temperature. I'd done a bit of work on the bridge, taking down the log every hour um, and uh, for, for the um, crew and uh, mainly actually because I was felt really seasick and actually drawing was quite a good way of kind of getting your eye line on the horizon. And so I, I was aware um, that the temperature was going up, uh, sorry, down as we traveled up. And it was only when I got back to the studio and I had space to put out all these drawings that I could actually visually see that. It was really, it felt really moving to see that that, that had controlled my drawing because the ice um, crystals in the ink had, by the end it was, totally in you know I, I had to almost drop it onto the page because the brush was just a solid sort of ice block um but yeah it was in answer to your it was very palpable um evidence that you know the elements were controlling what was happening I had by the end little control over you know what, what the media did its own thing um and that was really I I I copied out the log book, all of the uh, time, put the time on each drawing. And then I could see that correlated really accurately with where we were in terms of the uh, latitude as we were traveling up. So yeah, it was, it was kind of, yeah, a bit magical. Um, I suppose if I wanted to respond to that, there's a couple of things about, uh, I think I think I get, I get images of Ruskin's drawings of, of rocks and mountains and how, how um, incredible within his drawing is his geological understanding of how rock isn't fixed. He kind of draws the thrust upward of mountains and, and the kind of churn of rock. Because um, we, yeah, we need something to be solid. <laughs> even stone that are most kind of you know solid as a rock is is a kind of big conceptual thing that we cling on to but but it's it's not solid and I suppose I have the same um a sort of slightly contradictory thing when I work with water because I try to make water still and for me water is this literal embodiment of like if you're by a river flowing you're actually watching time pass but what I do when I capture it is I make it still and I think about art and possibly particularly drawing gives us a, a ca capacity or a place to find stillness even if we are drawing flux and drawing movement and you know making drawings with huge kind of action in them um, they do slow us down um, and they do give us a stillness I mean, and there's also the kind of uh, you know it's one of the reasons I will repeatedly make the seamark drawings because it's a space where I become still and that's very uh, precious to me um, and I think when I look at that drawing it makes me still again even though I'm trying to draw the movement of water and the, the energy of water rather than a picture of the sea uh, the drawing itself gives me a stillness and I think taking um, it's something I, I bring into my teaching a lot and thinking about ecological thinking I, I also want to kind of body ecological thinking in relation to states of mind, states of well-being, um, as well as thinking about planetary well-being, trying to kind of incorporate that with um, an understanding of the individual's well-being within it. And I think, I, I don't know, Sarah, something about those humble shoes <laughs> that have somehow been found in a glacier. I mean, that's such a kind of needle in a haystack. <laughs> image and just just wondering if the shoe represents a loss of shoe or loss of life or um yeah just just what that shoe has been through and just how um yeah what a what a still point it comes to in the drawing um possibly stiller than when it was in the glacier <laughs> um yeah yeah thank you yeah there's, there's lots of shoes <laughs> lots of shoes um, <laughs> Yeah. that they are they're they're amazing objects just the, is, is that point of thinking about where have they it's that idea of the erratic the thing moving both in space but also in time having come down to us and appearing and thinking about what it's witnessed and and seen I had a I had a question because um 
uh, which is about gender and ice, mm. because the polar spaces are quite gendered spa spaces. Um, you know, they're, they're associated with kind of heroicism and explorers and who were almost exclusively male. I mean, there are exceptions to that. And I wondered, um, particularly Emma, if you could speak to um, your experience as a, as a woman in those spaces and what was your kind of, if there's any reflection on, um, yeah, the, how I think traditionally they, they are, are spaces not occupied by women. Um, yes, yeah, interesting. Uh, I mean, in Svalbard, there, there were there are several um, Norwegian and um, Scandinavian female explorers and um, remarkable women that, you know, against all odds, seem to kind of somehow survive in, in a really extreme situation. Um, I would say not only in icy extreme climes, but, you know, anywhere, actually, if you're a female out working in the landscape it's kind of a vulnerable place to be uh there's sometimes I you know I've had one or two kind of hairy situations but it is something I'm conscious of um but coming back to ice uh yeah I I think uh I do, actually that isn't down to gender in Svalbard because the bears don't distinguish <laughs> that's my <laughs> only thought when I'm there it's like don't get eaten um but uh <laughs> I think, um, yeah, it's, I would say, I've encountered actually, yeah, this is practically um, on an application for a, for a residency. It was with National Parks in America at um, one of their national parks, which was glaciated. And uh, I really, really wanted to go, but I thought, oh, it, it would be sensible to take another person, my, my partner, and, you know, it was up in the mountains and miles from anywhere. Uh, but they were categorical about, no, you have to be on your own. They can only one person can go. And uh, and I did think, wow, I'd like to know how many women actually come on this residency because, <laughs> you know, that's that's really asking. A, a, I mean, there's probably lots of women out there that would do that, but <laughs> it wasn't for me. Yeah, it's quite challenging, isn't it? I mean, your yeah. the sense of how pioneering um, you are. I know you're going out on, on uh, boats with other people and others to get to the locations, but there is a real sense of pioneering to understand and retracing steps that others have taken in order to document. And the non, I mean, it, there's a comment in the chat, which is about the, the non-human presence. I mean, the, the presence yeah. is of the viewer and you, the maker. Uh, and I, I think that's true from all three of you, yeah. is that the forming the equivalent to the experience and the equivalent to being the explorer of that experience um, seems quite fundamental. I mean, tipping it into exploring, I'm not an explorer, you know, I, I don't take risks, but, uh, you know, it is interesting to see how response is. I can't remember the woman's name who died on K2, I think it was, but it was, you know, the first and you know, first, foremost thing was she's a mother. What was she thinking of? You know, this is outrageous. And how many male explorers of many, many who die on mountains? You know, that's never the first response is he was a father. What was he thinking of? You know, I think it is tough for a woman even now. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a really um, absolutely certain uh, within that. Um, the, there's a question that came in quite early from Sue um, and I think actually it's a question that relates to all of you as a question, although it may have come in in relation to, um, I think, when Emma was speaking. But the question is, is the act of drawing on plan air a form of gestural rehearsal that stays with you once making the studio scaled pieces? Sarah, do you want to start with that? I think either. Shall I? Sarah? I can answer that. I would say, yeah, almost um, perhaps less in my case in the landscape, but when I was talking about encountering the objects, the drawing is a kind of remote, it's like a form of remote sensing in itself. Your eyes attached to the artifact that you're drawing and your hand mimics the motion of your eyes and you're almost imaginatively touching the thing and it becomes a way of trying to imaginatively 
inhabit, sensorially inhabit the artifact. So kind of feeling it within your body and having that, then you have that bodily memory that you can transport and then used to, I don't know, what's the word? Re try and recreate that. You're trying to search for a way to make a drawing which is equivalent to that sensation that you feel if that makes sense so the way that i'm trying to then back in the studio use the, the materials the graphite the wax that papers to visually and materially represent be have an analogy with the way that i felt when i was in that relationship with those artifacts so while i couldn't touch them the drawing becomes a kind of proxy for touching when i'm seeing them which affects my body and then it's that bodily memory that then is what I'm drawing so if you like the drawings probably aren't of the glacial archaeology at all the drawings of the aura or the affect that they have on me as the viewer of those artifacts I think yeah thank you Sarah does anyone else want to to answer I think that's a great answer and um I I'd like to say I can't remember the last time I've drawn in the landscape for me personally the um i have great pleasure in being in the landscape uh, but it's about an unbound experience there isn't an edge to it and i only find the edge when i'm back in the studio so yes i'm in absolute awe of people <laughs> that uh, drawing uh, within it is part of their practice so I, I have huge respect for it but i, I know it's not part of what I have done so far who knows I might be working up to it okay. um, and that was really interesting Sarah um, I think you you really eloquently described the the sensory um, kind of experience that happens when when you're drawing something and I I find it a very strange um, like almost a portal without making it into something mystical it is like another space that i'm going into incredibly focused more so than in the studio actually because it's very unselfconscious there's so much to grapple with with all the exterior the, the, the weather and the, the elemental um exposure and you, you kind of um feel there's a kind of collapse i never feel anything's coming together on the page and uh it's quite remarkable so not often not but you know it back in the studio when i review things and i think god i have made some sort of sense out of that um which it always seems a bit of a miracle because um there, there's definitely a, an unconscious state when i'm out drawing rather than in the studio where it's perhaps more consciously constructed um, and i'm more self-consciously working um yeah which is a, a very odd performative thing going back to the question about gesture um i think probably uh yeah it is a sort of reenactment of that in the studio although the photographs have all that uh, information and document which is really important just in terms of structuring something um it's actually my drawings and the uh kind of recall of that event, that act that I can most enter into when I'm working. So it's it's a combination. That's great, thank you. And then I'm going to, sorry, yes, sir. I'm just gonna follow what Emma said to, to round it up with um, Tanya mentioned Ruskin and his um, appreciation of, of rocks as well. But as an advocate for drawing, there's that famous quote from Ruskin about using drawing not to make a picture, but to better see and understand the world. But I think what Emma was saying really um, emphasizes that that knowledge isn't necessarily visual or um, verbal or intellectual. It can be very much embodied or sensory knowledge as well. So that that only struck me when you were speaking there. Thank yeah, you. I think that's a wonderful rounding of that. I mean, I think drawing is making equivalent to the experience and we're drawing on all of those senses and experiences, knowledge, different kinds of contexts and references in order to distill something uh, into forming an equivalent to that whole experience. I think what's rather beautiful in all three of your work is that sense of capturing the fugitive 
um, because of, in a way it's the fugitive landscape, but actually the sense of drawing has a sense of that um, uncapturable essence. But I think, um, you know, there is one more question I want to bring in, which is from Jerry, which is about translating touch, cold materiality of place visually is shared by all you, all you three. And where do you see some where do you see similar approaches in say poetry, dance, cinema? Is there a, is there an equivalent uh, approach to translating these experiences anywhere other than through drawing? Of course. Oh, there's the <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean all of those things, and certainly music. Um, and sound, you know, I, I feel um, sound and movement, you know, I, it, it often crosses my mind. And it's really interesting, Tanya, to see your, your film, uh, your, your moving image that you're putting together, um, which, you know, incorporates drawing into that because I've, I always feel um, frustrated that there's this other these other dimensions which um, I mean there is movement a lot of movement in drawing but uh, yeah I mean I'm not really answering Jerry's question I just think the the translation of um, the cold materiality of place when when you witness it um, uh, it fascinates me to see other other interpretations through other forms yeah mm. Fantastic, thank you. I think as we're coming up to almost time, um, I think I'd like to say an enormous thank you for three really thought-provoking, inspiring, imaginative and fabulous presentations, presenting stunning work that really does uh, provoke our concerns, it references, it bears witness uh, most extraordinarily uh, to a changing and precarious landscape. So I think everyone can actually put their microphones on. And I'm sure that one of them from the MFA drawing will be the loudest clap, if there are more of them watching. Um, but I think, can I just say what a, what a fantastic event, what generosity in sharing your approaches and explorations to think about how do we form an equivalent through drawing to engage others through art and science in terms of understanding what's happening in the world and how precarious that is, how important it is to take note, to take action um, and to respond to what is our sustaining world um, and to make sure that we take care of that as much as we take care of each other. So can I say a huge thank you? You can actually clap and I'm <laughs> sure that there will be some clapping. Um, it's been a stunning evening, really rich conversation, lots of fantastic comments in the chat and what I'd like to do is just ensure that everybody knows that in two weeks time uh, we have the second of the series of drawing discussions in relation to Sarah Casey's exhibition Emergency which will be called which is an event called Drawn from Ice a conversation between art and alpine archaeology so I highly recommend it it follows on thematically and in depth in terms of the research underpinning Sarah's work. Um, I think it will be a fabulous event too. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again very soon. Thank you. And do get along to see the show. Thanks, Anita. Thank you. Thank you. And our speakers just stay with us for a moment.